Hello, and welcome to another Space Foundation Space Commerce Entrepreneurship interview. I'm Lee Steinke with Space Foundation. Today, I have the privilege of talking with Dr. Namrata Goswami, an independent scholar on space policy. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Goswami. Thank you, Lee, for having me. It's an honor. Dr. Namrata Goswami is an independent scholar on space policy, great power politics, and ethnic conflicts. She was a subject matter expert in international affairs with the Futures Laboratory in Alabama and a guest lecturer for the India Today class at Emory University. After earning her PhD in international relations from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, she worked as a research fellow at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. She has been a visiting fellow at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, Norway, at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia, and at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. She was a Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow at the United States Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C., and is awarded a Fulbright Nehru Senior Fellowship. In 2016, she was awarded the Minerva Grant by the Office of the U.S. Secretary of Defense to study great power competition in outer space. In April 2019, Dr. Goswami testified before the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission on China's space program. Her book, The Naga Ethnic Movement for a Separate Homeland, Stories from the Field, was published by Oxford University Press in March of 2020. Her co-authored book, Scramble for the Skies, The Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space, was published in October 2020 by Lexington Press, an imprint of Roman and Littlefield. Dr. Goswami gave a TEDx talk explaining her work and life at the Rosa Parks Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Currently, she is working on two more books on outer spot on space power and China's grand strategy. Namrata, in your TEDx talk, you championed the democratization of space. In a way, I think your decision to become an entrepreneur as an independent scholar is a part of the democratization of academia. Can you tell us about how you decided to become an entrepreneur as an independent scholar and what that means for how you go about your work? Sure. Thank you, Lee. So, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. So my decision to become an independent entrepreneur was also based on my application for a Minerva research grant uh, in 2016. And so when I received the grant uh, as an independent scholar, I was asked to establish a separate consultancy, especially if you have to get funding from the US federal government. You need a dunce number, a SAM number and registration, and also uh, enlist yourself as a small business. So in a sense, that actually enable me to get the funding without having to be affiliated with any other university or think tank. And that was the start of my decision to establish myself as a separate consultancy. However, the process of thinking through the need to establish myself as an independent scholar had been in my mind for some years before I actually went about doing the bureaucratic process. And it's been a very exciting journey since, since I uh, went ahead and did that. Well, you have a fascinating story. Would you share more about your background with our audience? Surely. So I originate from the northeast of India, which is a very remote region in India. It's mountainous. It's not connected as much to the Indian mainland. And so growing up, as I mentioned in my TEDx talk as well at the Rosa Parks Museum, one of the inspiration of my life was of course my father, Tarun Chandra Goswami, who encouraged me to study international relations, great power politics, the several wars that happened in the world, including the First and the Second World War, and colonization, which had a deep impact on India. So given that background, I was always interested in studying international relation, uh, grand strategy, great power politics, especially with regard to space. And so because of that, I did a PhD in international relations 
from Jawaharlal Nehru University, as you mentioned, in 2006. And since then, I have been researching on Asian geopolitics, US space policy, China space policy, as well as India space policy. And what is even more uh, humbling for me is that my work has been able to reverberate around global audiences. And I have been invited across the world to present my work. And so that's a bit of my background. That's wonderful. And fathers can be such strong influences on our choices. Yes, they can be. <laughs> How did space become a central part of your work? So uh, for the last 20 years or so, I have been studying uh, the rise of Asia, especially the countries like China, India, Japan, uh, as well as some other countries like Indonesia in Southeast Asia. So as I was doing my work, looking at the great power politics, especially China and India, and then looking at their focuses, what I realized was that in that particular comprehensive research strategy, especially for your audience, what came across was their focus, especially increasing focus on the space sector, including the commercialization of space in the last few years. So uh, as a scholar studying great power politics and international relations, I would be doing the uh, domain a disservice if I did not include space as a part of my analysis. And that's how my decision since uh, the last seven, eight years to include space in my overall understanding of international relations. That's wonderful that the activity actually drove that decision. Um, who have been some of your partners and mentors along the way and how have they helped you? You know, Lee, there are so many people who have uh, inspired me. Uh, as I mentioned, my father, my mother's uh, simplicity and her wonderful advice to me to be able to connect with the universe, especially in uh, the mountain town I grew up where I could look at the stars without too much electricity. So that was one inspiration. Uh, in terms of uh, my brother, I cannot forget to mention my brother, Sanjay Goswami, who was always interested in space as well, as all of us growing up in the 1980s, watching Star Trek, Star Wars, and also Indian folk tales on the universe. So he has been a big inspiration and support. And in academia, I would say my uh, professors, uh, especially Professor uh, Chakraborty from Cotton College, uh, which was my college where I did my graduation. My PhD supervisors, Professor Amitav Mattu and Professor Kanti Bajpai uh, from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, my co-author, Peter Gerritsen, who has been a big uh, support and in terms of how we conceptualize space. Uh, and, so, and also uh, folks like Dennis Wingo, who wrote Moon Rush who had long conversations with me explaining the critical importance of the moon. So the list is endless. I have so many other people that I can mention in that particular influence uh, factor. It makes for a wonderful career when you have so many wonderful partners. And support, yeah. What have been some of your biggest challenges in your career? So uh, there are two challenges I can think of. One is, of course, as a woman coming from a very remote area in India to educate yourself, especially when there is traditional pressure to get married very early and not pursue a PhD. So I would say uh, to the path of becoming an academic entrepreneur, I understood the unique challenges women can face, especially women coming from regions that do not have that kind of uh, support structure. The second challenge that I faced in terms of becoming an entrepreneur was the risk that you have to take, especially when you do not want to be affiliated with a particular university or institution. It takes a bit of courage and uh, the willingness to take financial risk to establish your own consultancy and to be willing to live uh, very simply. So I found that challenging in the beginning, but I've learned a lot from that. And besides those two challenges, the third challenge I would say is to uh, establish yourself at a level where people, especially in the space community across the world, start to listen to you and take you seriously. And for that, I think very hard work research understanding of details, uh, objective bipartisan analysis as the Space Foundation also aspires for is a challenge as well. 
I love that just the meat of the work is the greatest challenge. Um, re really, uh, the focus on study and making yeah. a difference in understanding. And now we'll take a short break for some great insight on what's happening at Space Foundation. Space Foundation is a nonprofit advocate organization offering gateways to information, education, and collaboration for space exploration and space-inspired industries that drive the global space ecosystem. Space Foundation, advocating for innovation, bettering life on Earth. Welcome back to our entrepreneurship interview with Dr. Namrata Goswami, independent scholar on space policy. Before the break, we talked about some of the biggest challenges you've encountered in your work. Now tell us about some of your most cherished successes. So that's a, such a wonderful question because when I thought about that, uh, when I received that question uh, in different panels across the world, the one thing that I really uh, cherish as an entrepreneur is to be able to make an impact uh, at the national level, both in the US, uh, but also globally. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that makes me feel very grateful because uh, su the success of being able to be heard for your perspective, especially my analysis of international relations and space policy and space advocacy has been one of my successes. And I feel very uh, appreciative of that. The second uh, success that I can think of is the ability to publish. So as an independent scholar and entrepreneur, it gives me great satisfaction that my opinion pieces have been published at the national level, including the Washington Post. My research has been reflected back in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Diplomat, uh, Live Encounters Magazine, which is a village-based community publication, very similar again to what the Space Foundation aspires for, building global networks based on not just global conversations, but also community local conversations. So that I see as a success. And I think finally, I would say that being able to publish uh, books uh, at the academic level. So in the uh, domain of uh, space policy and space theory and space power, it is really critical as an independent scholar to be able to publish and get published by academic presses. So the fact that Roman and Littlefield, which is a very reputable uh, academic press, uh, reached out for a book proposal after listening to me present at the International Studies Association Conference in 2017, Teen. And then the whole process of writing the book uh, and being able to publish it within deadline and then to see the book have an impact in terms of space conversations, space advocacy, uh, space resources. Uh, just recently, the book was listed as a strategic reading uh, requirement by a Forbes list on readings for space policy. And so I think I feel a great amount of satisfaction and uh, a, a feeling of success because of that. That's wonderful. And I do wanna reiterate for our audience that you published two books in 2020, and that makes for one of the most productive pandemic experiences I've heard about anywhere. <laughs> Can you describe the process uh, of, so it sounds like you were invited to publish the one book, um, and you know, how, is that, how does that process work uh, as an independent scholar? So for an independent scholar or for anyone in academia, I think the process is similar. So first you read the literature that exists, including literature across academia, government, uh, commercial actors, uh, think tanks, bipartisan conversations, nonpartisan conversations like the Space Foundation. And then you think about what is that idea that needs to be uh, you know, sketched out more, need, uh, where you need more data, where you need more conversations. So in an academic book, what you need to do is that you need to start with a hypothesis, which for your audience would mean a statement that can be falsified. So if, for example, if I say that space resources are what is going to determine the great power competition in 2060, it has to be a falsifiable hypothesis. There could be data that can counter that. And that's where the science method comes in. So you start with an idea like that. And then what you need to do is once you have an idea, you need to find someone who will fund you 
for that particular idea. So you write a book proposal, which uh, I did and my co-author did, Peter Gerritsen. And then once you have funding, which uh, we got through the Minerva Research Grant uh, from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, after that process, once you have the idea, you have the book proposal, you have the funding, uh, you basically then would want to look out for a publisher. In my case, as I mentioned, I was presenting a part of that idea and it got picked up by uh, Luxington Press, a part of Roman and Littlefield. And then once you have that, I think it's very critical to get the data. So you have the idea, you have the funding, you have the publisher. Now you have to be able to not just do secondary survey, which means looking at documents and uh, articles and published work, but you also have to do field work. So I was very fortunate to be able to do field work in both China and India and the US in terms of collecting data through which we interviewed policymakers, academia, commercial actors. And then once you have the data, you write. The writing is the hardest because you have to, it took us about three years to write the book. So it's a long process of writing the chapters. And then once it's an academic book, uh, especially for your audience, I would say that academic books are different from public books or books that are uh, published by non-academic presses. So in academic books, you go through a very stringent process of peer review. So there are two anonymous reviewers who would review a book. And unless you are able to pass that process, which is about six months, the book does not get published. So we had to go through that process as well. So that's how uh, a book is uh, basically conceptualized. I would say it's a very exciting and passionate uh, engagement, especially if it's on a topic that you enjoy working on. Wonderful. Yes, the, the amount of pre-work that needs to be done before you secure a publisher funding um, sound, sounds daunting. Um, and you have to have a certain amount of confidence going into that. Um, that you will be published. So getting down to the business of business, who are your key customers and how do you balance business development with your academic work? So my key customers are a multi, uh, a mul a multiple set of actors. One, uh, one of my key customers is, of course, the U.S. government, especially the federal government, where I not only produce policy papers, including, as I mentioned, uh, based on a research grant for the Department of Defense, but then I also do workshops and consultancy for uh, the U.S. Space Force uh, to an extent. I give lectures around the world, including in the U.S. at universities, who is one of my primary uh, you know, actors or uh, clients, if I may. Uh, and finally, besides lectures and writing, I also do consultancy for a commercial uh, space sector. So I basically offer my analysis on international relations, especially deep dives into countries like China, the United States, Luxembourg, India, because private sector is interested in understanding that particular world. So they form a part of my clients as well. And then one of my clients, which has been a, a, a contributor in terms of creating visibility, has also been the media, uh, different media platforms uh, for which if I write an article, I get paid an honorarium. And so it has been a very exciting and very fulfilling uh, environment in which I've been able to work. So those are my basic clients in terms of my work. Wonderful. And tell us about, you mentioned the importance of advocacy and how much you care about getting that word out, how gratifying it is to see that people are absorbing uh, the work that you're putting out. Talk about the importance of that advocacy and awareness about space for the general public. I think, Lee, that is the most critical aspect. So, for example, one of my advocacy is to highlight the importance of space at the level of international global conversations, which I try every day through my working, my presentations, my conversations. It is very important to explain the critical importance of space for me uh, to not just international relations conversations, as I mentioned before, but also to explain to the population across countries as to why space is critical. What is it about space that people need to care for? For example, I have to highlight issues like 
navigation, your global positioning system, right? The fact that you can use GPS on your phone, not many people realize that it's dependent on about four satellites supporting it, right? So in China, it's of course the Baidu navigation system, which is their own system. The fact that you can use your ATM or you can use your credit card, the fact that you can have weather forecasting, like you can have a prediction of a storm or a hurricane, or, for example, one of my other important uh, advocacy role is to highlight the importance of international global collaboration in terms of space. The global community looking at space as a common domain and then actually from that position trying to understand both the competitive and the cooperative part of space. So I have uh, my whole life, I can say, is geared towards that, to raise the visibility of space in terms of those different levels of conversation. And I think besides advocacy, it's very important to be timely. So especially for an independent scholar, it is really critical that, for example, if there is an event, say the Chinese have launched a space component to create their permanent space station there is an audience at that exact time to understand the implications of that. And so based on your advocacy, which is supported by very deep detailed research, you can then write an article that can help people understand what that means. So advocacy is critical in terms of highlighting the importance of space. And I'll end by saying that if you look at the US uh, space conversations today, the need for advocacy is very high, especially the growing importance of the commercial space sector, including companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. Why should the US public be interested in space? We knew why the US public needed to be interested during the Cold War, because it was a competition with the USSR as to which is the more attractive ideology. That is not the case today. It's more about space economy, the importance of space for critical infrastructure, and advocacy explaining that to the electorate that actually funds separate space programs is critical. Yeah, you do such a nice job of balancing what you mentioned about competitive forces and collaborative forces uh, side by side, always, always in play, um, and just as a consumer, I really appreciate your expertise there. Uh, is there anything else you would like to share with our audience today? The, the only thing I would like to share with your audience today, given the fact that the Space Foundation and the larger audience is a nonpartisan group that works for global understanding of space and, and collaboration to a very large extent, uh, I would say that it's really important to understand that the context of how space is viewed has changed. So as I mentioned before, the Cold War understanding of space as a area of competition where you can showcase the attractiveness of a particular sector, which is limited to prestige, very limited presence in space, three days uh, to the extent of, if I remember some of the moon landings, that particular idea of space has changed. Today, space is about economic benefits. Space is about how you can uplift people on Earth from, say, getting access to the Internet, which is satellite-based Internet. And finally, if you listen to the conversations coming out of countries like China and to an extent Russia today and India, space is about establishing permanent presence so how can space resources for example resources on the moon can benefit people and turn humanity into a truly spacefaring civilization so the context of space is changing and that is why i'll get back to my tech talk democratization of space is becoming more critical so during the cold war it was a very elite state-funded astronauts that got the opportunity to go to space Today, space is not yet there. We still need to be, have billions to be able to go to space. But one day, my, my vision and my hope is that we will be able to access launch systems which are usable for a person like me to be able to go to space or my children coming after who can afford to go to space like our uh, grandfathers were able to access plane tickets, which were expensive at one time, but then the cost of it came down. And that's where true democratization of space will happen. So exciting. Namrata, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us today. 
Thank you, Lee, and thank you for having me. It's a great honor for me. If you're interested in learning more about our Space Commerce program or watching other entrepreneurship interviews, go to spacefoundation.org and check out our Space Commerce series under our Center for Innovation and Education. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again. There's a place for you in the new global space ecosystem.